It's been a crazy week. I don't know about you. I've heard some stories of other people just having crazy weeks. And sometimes in the midst of that, we just step back and we get into God's presence and just worship him, take our focus off of ourself and our, our junk and just really just focus on him. And I know I needed that. So thank you so much, guys. So uh, on to the next part of the night, which I'm very excited about. One of my good friends, Alexa Moody, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. Um, she's going to share a lot about her story and share a message with us tonight. But I I just want you to just put your hands together for Alexa Moody. Thank you. All right, testing, testing. Can you guys hear me? Yes, excellent. All right, good afternoon, evening, everybody. Just waiting for my uh, PowerPoint to eventually come up. But in the meantime, let me introduce myself. Hey, my name is Alexa Moody. Uh, you can remember my name because Amazon Alexa, so that's fun. And also my last name is Moody, which is actually really funny because what I do is I teach about mental health and suicide prevention. So it's kind of fun to have a last name that ties right into what I do. So basically I'm a giant joke, uh, so that's fun. Um, so yeah, let me tell you just a tiny bit about what I do. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time up in Kingston, 44 area. I've never been up this way before. I'm from Harrisburg. And so it was quite a drive to come out. I'm very excited to be here. Very honored that Dan invited me to be the keynote speaker tonight. And what I do is I am the executive director and the founder of a nonprofit called Please Live. And through Please Live, we provide education and awareness on youth mental health and suicide prevention. So needless to say, I really like talking about uncomfortable topics. It's kind of fun whenever I introduce myself to someone and they say, what do you do? And I say, I work in suicide prevention. And they go, oh, uh, like that's an interesting field, right? So I love it, though. I love talking about difficult things. And so you know, through Please Live and through our kind of ministry arm, which is called Love Life Ministries, which was actually Dan's baby that he gave me, so thank you. Uh, through our, our ministry arm with Love Life Ministries, we really kind of teach mostly young people, but really the message of mental health and suicide prevention is throughout the entire age span. Everybody struggles from time to time. And so we do kind of have a typical presentation that we do. And while I was preparing for tonight, I really felt like God wanted to change up what I was going to talk about a little bit. And so instead of doing kind of my typical like medical model, what is a mental illness, you know, parts of the brain and all that stuff, I didn't want you guys to feel like you're back in health class. And so instead of doing that, I really felt like God wanted us to talk about wounds and scars tonight. And so before I get any further, I actually just want to ask you guys a question. Does anyone here have a scar on their body with like a really cool story behind it? Like you did something ridiculous, you got a scar on your body. A couple of you? Does anyone want to share their story with what they did? You want to? Go ahead. Tell us what happened. <laughs> the other night, climb on spurs, which are like these metal things you can grab through your leg with spikes for about three inches long and go into the tree. Well, I got done taking the tree down, and I was putting myself away, and I tripped and stabbed myself in the leg with my spikes. And we're all the way in, it hit the bone. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so you got this nice big scar on your leg. All right. Anyone else? Does anyone else have a cool scar with some ridiculous story that you might want to share? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so I have a I have a a, a scar story that I'm going to share with you guys as well, just in case no one else shared their stories. But thank you both of you for being willing to share your stories of your scars. When I was 10 years old, I woke up one morning and I had a really bad stomach ache, like the worst stomach ache I've ever had in my life. 
And I went to my mom and I told her that I wasn't feeling well and that my stomach hurt. And you know, I'm 10, and of course 10 year olds are over dramatic. And so my mom said, okay, have some Tylenol, you know, have some soup, go to sleep. You probably have the flu. Well, I took some Tylenol, I went to bed, I woke up a couple hours later, my stomach hurt even worse. It felt like somebody was stabbing me with a knife into my stomach. And so I'm crying to my mom and I'm saying, I'm sick, I'm sick, my stomach hurts, my stomach hurts. And she's saying, okay, well, there's nothing I can do. You know, like, you're just gonna have to sleep it off, you have the flu. And so I'm saying, mom, take me to the doctor. And she's saying, the doctors can't do anything. We're gonna go to the doctor, they're gonna tell you you have the flu, and they're gonna tell you to take Tylenol and go back to bed. You just gotta sleep it off and get through it. Well, I continued, you know, on and off trying to sleep throughout the rest of the day. And by, it probably was like 18 hours later, it was like midnight at this point, I'm crying. I've gotten to the point where I'm in so much pain, I'm actually like delusional. Like I'm feeling like the room spinning, and I'm telling my mom, there's something wrong. I'm in a whole lot of pain. You need to take me to the doctor. And so my mom knew that I was terrified of hospitals. So she tries to pull the mom trick, and if you're a mom, you know what I'm talking about. The mom trick where she's like, well, all the doctor's offices are closed, so if we're gonna go anywhere, we're gonna have to go to the hospital. And she's expecting me to be like, nope, nope, I'm fine, I'm going back to bed, because I'm terrified of the hospital. Instead, I cry even harder and I say, yes, please take me to the hospital, something is wrong. And that's when she was like, oh, something's wrong. <laughs> she takes me to the emergency room and I had appendicitis. And so, uh, if you don't know what appendicitis is, basically my appendix was in the process of exploding. It was kind of painful, not a fun time. So by 2 a.m. I was getting emergency surgery and I no longer have an appendix. But I do have this nice little scar, I'm not gonna show it to you, but it's about right here. It's about this big, this little scar that I have on my stomach from when I got my appendix out. And you can bet that for the rest of my life and still to this day, I use that against my mom. So if I ever say anything to her and she says, yeah, right, Alexa, I'll be like, oh, don't you believe me? Just like you didn't believe me when my appendix was exploding, huh? <laughs> so you can bet that I use that against her all the time. And so scars are evidence of a story, right? When you have a scar, it means that something happened to you. It means that you lived, something went on. There is a story behind that scar. And sometimes the stories aren't that great, right? Sometimes they're silly, sometimes they're funny. Sometimes at the time, they're not funny, but now they are, like my appendix, not funny at the time, now it's funny. I can laugh at it now, but it was not funny when it was happening. But scars are evidence of a story. And because of that, our scars can also tell a lot about us and about the things that we've experienced and been through. The problem is that many people are actually living with a wound and not a scar, and there's a difference. And so when I was thinking about you know, what I was supposed to teach you guys tonight, I really felt that God wanted me to teach you the differences between wounds and scars. And I'm gonna be telling you three very important things about wounds and scars, but first we need to understand what is the differences between them. So a wound, these are just di uh, dictionary definitions, a wound is an injury to living tissue caused by a cut, blow, or other impact, typically one in which the skin is cut or broken. It is an active injury, it is hurting right now. A scar, on the other hand, is a mark left by a healed wound, sore, or burn. So scarring is evidence of healing. If you have a wound, it has not healed yet. It is still open. It is still hurting you. It is still affecting you. It can get worse. It can get infected. A scar, on the other hand, it doesn't really bother you anymore. My scar for my appendix, I honestly forget I have it most of the time. I can go months, even years, forgetting it's even there. I don't typically look at that part of my body, so I'm not even really seeing it very often but it doesn't hurt me anymore. I can remember how much it hurt when I was 10, but it is no longer impacting my life the way it did when it was still healing. And so understanding the differences between wounds and scars in a physical sense, we can apply this to the mental, emotional, and spiritual sense as well. We all have wounds. 
We have them emotionally, we have them physically, we have them spiritually, psychologically, socially. In every area of our lives, we can be wounded, but we can also have scars. And so the first point that I want to make is that we are going to be wounded. This is a given, this is inevitable, we cannot escape it. We live in a, in a world where wounds are going to happen and scars are expected. And you can see I have some scripture there on the screen. Matthew tells us what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. And Acts 14 tells us we all have to experience many hardships before we enter the kingdom of God. And so one of the things that I love about the Bible and about scripture is how vivid the imagery is. Jesus taught us in parables and in images. And I love that because it makes it so much easier to understand. And one of the many parables and the images that he tells us is that we are soldiers in his army. I think we all grew up, you know, that we're soldiers in Christ. And I forget the song. It just left my mind as I said it. But uh, yeah, someone's humming it. Yes. And so, you know, we know that we are part of God's army. We know that we're soldiers. We hear that imagery all the time. And in fact, God even gives us armor for being soldiers. And Ephesians is actually one of my favorite books in the Bible because we are given armor not just for the, the imagery of being a soldier in God's army, but also because of the pieces of the armor that we are able to use, not only physically, but spiritually and mentally and emotionally in the battles that we experience. And so I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Uh, I have the, the bolded parts there talking about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit. But the most important thing, I think, in this verse is actually right before we talk about all the pieces where it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Most of the wounds we are going to experience in this life is not going to be physical stuff. It's going to be the mental and emotional and spiritual stuff that comes our way. And what soldier goes into battle and expects not to get hurt? Soldiers know that they are going into a war zone, and they're prepared for it. They're ready for it. They know to expect it. And we also need to know that we're going into spiritual and, em and emotional and mental war zones, and we need to be prepared for that. It is very, very clear. I'm not sure how, how much clearer God could make it. The thing about mental and emotional and spiritual battles, though, is that the easiest place for the enemy to take us down is within our own minds. If you see a physical attacker, then you know it's coming, right? You can block their blows. If somebody go, takes a swing at you, you can see it coming. But the enemy is so cunning that he gets into our minds and he says things like, I am not worthy. I am not loved. God has given up on me. And because the enemy uses I and me inside of our thoughts, we think they are our thoughts when in reality, that is actually just Satan's favorite battleground, because if you don't know you're fighting, then you don't know to defend yourself. And if you don't know to defend yourself, then you're going to lose. The other thing with mental and emotional and spiritual wounds is that when we are wounded physically on the surface, our body kind of takes care of that for us, right? Like when I got my appendix out, I got stitches. I was in the hospital for a couple of days. I had morphine, which was pretty great. Uh, just being real here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I had, I had, you know, bandages. I had to make sure I changed my bandages. But for the most part, my immune system kicked in. And, you know, I didn't have to sit there and focus. I didn't have to think, okay, blood flow to my abdomen, okay, cells divide and stitch. I didn't have to think about that. The body kind of did it on its own. The problem with mental and emotional and spiritual wounds, though, is that we don't have like a mental immune system to just kick in. It actually does take effort. It takes focus for us to recognize when we are wounded and to focus on healing. It, it does take 
conscious effort. And because of that, many people don't put that conscious effort into healing their wounds, and their wounds just begin to fester and get worse, or they never scar over, or every time they get the scab, they pick it loose mentally and emotionally because they don't know that they have to actually try and put effort into healing. So how can we tell the difference emotionally, mentally, between having a wound versus a scar? So with a scar, it does not actively hurt you when you think about it. I'm talking about my appendix. I'm not in pain right now. This is not bothering me. Even though I remember how much that hurt in the past, I'm not in pain right now. I can kind of move and jump and dance and nothing's hurting me. You do not bleed onto other people with a scar. There's no blood. Everything's fine. Everything's all stitched up. I'm nice and clean. With a scar, you can easily continue with your day. Like I said, I'm not thinking about it. I can go months, even years, without even remembering that I've got this scar. It doesn't come up day after day, moment after moment. It does not make you harbor intense feelings. Now, what I mean by that, when I was 10 and I was being kind of rushed into the emergency room, I definitely had a moment where I was like, okay, am I gonna die because of what I'm experiencing? God, are you there? <laughs> like, is this it? You have those intense questions and those intense feelings. And with a scar, it doesn't make you question the promises of God, which again, it kind of ties into the same thing. God, are you there? Is this really how I'm gonna go? A wound, on the other hand, is actively causing you pain right now. You think about it, it's not just a memory of pain. It's not just, oh, I remember when that happened, it was really bad, but right now you are feeling it. You are feeling the pain right now. It affects your relationships with other people. It bleeds onto them, so to speak. Maybe you've become suspicious of others. Maybe you feel like, well, people are nice to my face, but once they leave, they probably talk behind my back. Maybe you feel unlovable. The way that you interact with other people becomes affected because your emotional and mental wound is bleeding onto the relationships in your life. You can't stop thinking about what happened. It pops up everywhere you go. You don't get a moment's rest from it. Are associated with intense feelings. Those could be feelings of betrayal. It could be feelings of depression, of anxiety. It could become with a mental illness or not. It could be PTSD. It could be toxic stress. Those deep, deep feelings that are more than just a bad day. And I think you guys know what I mean by that. And it makes you question God's promises. Anecdotally, what I've found working in mental health and working, talking with, with Christians and in the church, I've found that when things go really, really badly and somebody is struggling with their faith because of something going really bad, they tend to go one of two directions. Either they go the direction that this whole God thing isn't real, this whole church thing was just a lie and none of it's real and it's all fake, or they go the direction that God is real but he does not care about me and that his promises are not true. Or maybe he's the God that set up the world and walked away and he's just letting it go and he doesn't care anymore. And either of those directions, when we start to really question the promises and the certainty and the truth of God, because of something that happened to us, that's evidence that you are still hurting, that you are wounded, and that wound has not healed yet. So I wanna tell you guys about one of my own wounds, one of my own emotional wounds. And this isn't a specific thing that's happened to me, but more so a, a lifelong thing I've dealt with. But I live with depression and anxiety. Those are mental illnesses. It's part of the reason why I got into the field of mental health, because I know how it feels to live with those kinds of illnesses. And I started struggling with depression when I was in elementary school, I was about nine. And because Back then, mental health wasn't really discussed. I didn't really learn about it in health class. I didn't really learn about it in school. That illness within me got worse because I didn't get treatment. Just like any other illness, if you don't get it treated, it can get worse. Same thing with mental illnesses. And so that depression started to get worse year after year. By the time I was in high school, I was suicidal. Again, that's why I work in suicide prevention, because I know how it feels to be in that place. And so 
living with depression, living with anxiety, having a point in my life where I struggled with suicidal thoughts, those were all very active wounds. I woke up in the morning and I felt it the moment I opened my eyes. I felt that deepness and that despair and that darkness. I could not escape it. That was a wound that followed me everywhere I went. And I, it affected my relationships. I believed that nobody could love me. I believed that I would never amount to anything. It affected my relationship with God. I thought, if he is there, he's just not listening to me. It was a very, very deep wound that I had to focus on healing from, but I didn't know how. Because who teaches you how to do that, right? And so I was very lucky, and I actually did end up uh, not dying by suicide, obviously. And I did end up seeing a counselor and a therapist who taught me how to work through my emotional wounds. And so that's why I'm able to be here today, to be able to teach you guys about wounds and scars. I'm going to come back to that point uh, in just a minute. The second point that I want to make is that your wounds are meant to heal. Yes, we are all going to be wounded. We are all going to experience terrible things, and God knows that, but God never intends for you to stay in that wound. He is always intending for that wound to heal. So again, some scripture I've got going on here. We have Psalms uh, 147. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds, curing their pains and their sorrows. I love that verse. And then Psalm 30, you have turned my mourning into dancing for me. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. And so, again, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite things about the Bible is the vivid imagery that the Bible uses whenever God, Jesus, is trying to teach us something. And one of my favorite uh, images is that of clay pots and earthen vessels. We see this all over Scripture. In Isaiah, it says, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hands. In Lamentations, it says, the precious sons of Zion weighed against fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen jars, the work of a potter's hands. And 2 Corinthians tells us, but we have this treasure, the Holy Spirit, in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of power will be of God and not from ourselves. So let me teach you guys a little bit about uh, clay pots and earthen vessels. So way back in ancient times, clay pots were the most common type of pottery, right? Well, if a clay pot broke, if it got a crack or a chip in it, it actually was not enough to just slap some wet clay onto it, let it dry, and call it a day. It might look fixed, but the moment you tried to fill up that pot, the repair would pop right off. It wouldn't stick properly. And so that pot could not be used in its intended purpose. So what a potter had to do is they actually had to go out into the fields and they had to find a tick. Yeah, like a blood-sucking tick, the insect. And they found a tick that typically fed off of like sheep and lamb in the field, shepherd's field. And they would crush that tick into the wet clay and the blood that was inside that tick, there is a very special uh, property called hemoglobin and that is the part of our blood that allows blood to clot. And so they needed that hemoglobin to be mixed into the wet clay to put onto the pot so that it actually stuck because we had the, the sticking clotting property of the hemoglobin. And then the repair would actually stick. Now let me break this down for you. We are the clay pots. We are the earthen vessels. Things of clay are things of this world, and it is not enough to just slap some things of this world onto our broken pieces and hope that it sticks, because it won't. But you literally need the blood of a lamb mixed in with that clay to put onto our broken vessels, and that's how we're going to make the repair stick. Right? Mmm. Oh. Mmm. Jesus. <laughs> But you know, it's also important to note that you also just can't get a bunch of lamb's blood and put it on a vessel and hope that fixes it either, right? Like we need the clay. <laughs> we need both. You cannot hope to fill the void in your life with just earthen thing after earthen thing after earthen thing. But we also can't expect to not be clay vessels anymore. We need the clay. And so the things of this earth that we need with the blood of the lamb, 
we might need medicine. We might need to see a doctor. We need to eat well. We need to take care of our bodies. We need the people around us. We need friends and family and church to support us and to love us whenever we're hurting and when we're broken and when we're trying to repair ourselves. We need both. And there's nothing wrong with taking medicine or seeing a counselor or talking to a therapist. Those things we need. And we need them with the blood of the lamb. So the third point that I want to make is that your scars have a glorious purpose. We don't just get wounded and have scars just, you know, for fun, because that's not fun. God tells us that he uses all things for good, and I swear I did not talk to the worship band before I came up here, but it was just so cool, the songs that they chose and, and the, the message that was coming through that God uses all things for good, and I love it because I didn't talk to them beforehand, and it just kind of shows that you know God's in this message today, and he's here with us today, and he knows that someone here needs to be hearing this. A couple verses for you. Romans tells us, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And Peter tells us, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, it, this is, this is a, these verses and this concept that God uses all things for good was really, really hard for me for a very long time. How could God use depression for good? How could God use suicidal thoughts for good? The other things that happened to me, the circumstances, the people that betrayed me, the, the friends that left me, how, why would God do that to me for his good? But actually, God did not do those things to me, and I think that's really important. Depression is not good. Suicidal thoughts is not good, and nobody is trying to tell you that those things are. The things that have hurt you and have wounded you, nobody is trying to tell you that those things are good, because they're not. Those were bad things that hurt you. But despite the bad things in your life, God can use that for the ultimate good. That's really important to understand because if you think that God is specifically wounding you for some greater purpose, you're going to get kind of mad at him, right? That's not a nice thing to do. But if you're understanding that bad things happen to us and God can use you regardless of the bad things that happen, that is when you begin to understand the true meaning of this verse. Why was I born with depression? Well, so I could be here right now talking to you guys about it. I have had the opportunity and the honor to go into many churches and many schools and talk to students and, and adults, people of all ages that have come up to me and said, because of you, you've saved my life. And I bring that glory back to God because if I, if I hadn't experienced that, then these people would not have taken me seriously. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody about an experience you've had that they've never experienced? and how frustrating it is to try and explain, like, this is how I'm feeling, and they're like, yeah, I don't get it. The best people to listen to you and to sit with you in your hardship are the people who have also gone through hardship. And so depression is not something that God gave me. Suicidal thoughts is not something that came from him, but it is something that he walked me through, that he gave me the strength to survive, and through my scars, he is able to reach other people going through the same thing. So, your challenge. Because like I said, we all experience wounds, we all experience scars, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And so my challenge for you, what situations have you experienced in life, the good and the bad? Take a moment, think about them. What contributes to the story of your life? What did you learn from these situations? Are you currently suffering from a wound from a past experience? And if so, I really want to invite you guys to come up and pray with us afterwards. Maybe me, Dan, whoever else can, can work with you, sit with you, listen to your story, maybe give you some resources to help you turn that wound into a scar. And how can you fully heal and make that wound into a scar? What do you think God is preparing you for through your experiences? Again, both the good and the bad. 
And how do these experiences contribute to the story of your life? Because let's be real, every story has hardships. It wouldn't be a very good story if nothing happened, right? So the things that are happening to you has a glorious purpose. We will be wounded, those wounds are meant to heal, and those scars have a purpose. And so as uh, I kind of close, I have a video that I want you guys to just watch through. And while you listen to the video, while you listen to the words, think about some of these questions. And we're just gonna go ahead and play that right away.
prayer then, and then I'll invite Dan back up to move on to the next piece of the night. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just for me to be here tonight to speak to everybody who came out tonight and just share some of my heart, share some of your heart. Lord, I pray that if anyone here is wounded, that you just bring that, that to their mind right now, that they can be aware of, oh, this is something that is still fresh. This is something still active. This is something that needs healing. And God, I pray that your healing angels would just come into this room right now. And whether it's through miraculous touch, whether it's through doctors, whether it's through medicine, whether it's through friends, however you decide to bring that healing, Lord, we invite you in to just bring an atmosphere of healing today. We pray that you heal the wound, but we also pray that when we look at the scars of our lives that we can see your purpose in them, that we can know that we do not suffer in vain, that the things that happen to us are not random, that the lives we are leading have a purpose. And God, we ask that you continue to use us through our scars, through the things that happen to us each and every day. We thank you for the opportunity to live our lives in service to you. In your heavenly name we pray, amen. Thank you. All right, let's give her a round of applause for sharing that amazing message. Thank you so much.